Well, good morning again, everyone. Good morning, Peter. Oh, it's a beautiful oh, day. Um, today, I want to talk about hope. Resurrection hope. And um, I just had so much to say that I might have to split it over a couple of weeks. So we'll, we'll get straight into it. I want to look at how the resurrection gives us hope. And when Jesus was crucified in 33 AD, there were only about 120 followers, weren't there, in, that, that were true to his message at that time. They were meeting in an upper room, about 120 followers. And today, 2,000 years later, 2.6 billion people in the world, that's 2.6 billion, claim to be a follower of Christ. 2.6 billion. Now let me put that into perspective for you. That means that one out of every three people on the planet say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. The Christian church is by far, by far, the largest organisation on planet Earth. Nothing else comes close to the size of the Christian church. 2.6 billion followers of Christ. The church is bigger than China. The church is bigger than China and Europe put together. The church, the Christian church, the followers of Christ is bigger than China and Europe and the United States put together. Nothing is bigger on planet Earth than the Church of Jesus Christ. And how in the world did that happen? Why did Christianity spread so far and so fast? How did a little band of 12 poor fishermen, the people that Jesus chose to be his first followers, how did that expand into one out of every three people on planet Earth? It's all in one word. Resurrection. Resurrection. That changed everything. When God said, I'm coming to earth to die for the sins of all mankind, and then I'm going to prove that I'm God by coming back to life three days later, that is the single most significant event in history. Nothing else comes close. It split history into AD and BC. Every other event in history is dated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, either before or after. Even your birthday is dated by the day, the month and the year on how many years it's been since the resurrection of Christ. It is the single most significant event in history because Jesus was resurrected. Now, when we talk about resurrection, we're not talking about when you die on the operating table, you know, and you might die three or four times, well, how do you do that? <laughs> right? Not that you die on the operating table and they bring you back. That's called resuscitation, isn't it? When you're drowning at the beach and the lifesaver brings you back, that's called <laughs> resuscitation, isn't it? That's not what we're talking about here. Resurrection doesn't mean that. Resurrection means that you've been pronounced dead by experts in death, Roman soldiers. Then your body was washed and wrapped and then placed in a cave-like tomb with a great stone closing the entrance. These things are all over Israel. If you go to the Holy Land, you'll see them as you're driving up and down the road. You'll see these tombs cut into the sides of hills and a round stone beside the opening. They're everywhere. And then when you're in that steel tomb, that, 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 uh, that tomb, that stone tomb, and you're sealed up for three days, and then you come back to life, only Jesus Christ has done that. That's resurrection. And that single event changed all of history. It changed those followers of Christ from being disconsolate and depressed and disillusioned and despair and defeated, lots of D words, into courageous and contagious people filled with hope. Amen. 
and they began to spread the message of hope everywhere because when they saw Jesus had come back to life, it changed everything. Mm. What I want to do this Easter is I want us to look at the reason why the followers of Jesus Christ are the most hopeful people on the planet. We have more hope than anyone else. There's no contest. We have far more hope than anyone else in the world because of what Jesus Christ did at the resurrection. Why do we have hope? In fact, I once... You remember, remember Dina, the yeah, preacher's nice. here, right? We'll see her later on this year here. She got a job as a, as, as a person who was responsible for case managing suicidal people. And she came to me and she said, how on earth do I do this, Peter? She said, my job description reads that if these people are still alive in three months, I will achieve my goals. How do I do that? And I said, you've got something that no one else has got, Dina. I said, you've got hope. You can say to these people, if I was to tell you there's light at the end of the tunnel, would it make a difference? And it does. And it did. And she is still employed with those people some, what, 20 odd years later. So that's what we're talking about here. Hope. Number one, the first reason Jesus' resurrection gives us hope is we've been completely forgiven. Completely forgiven. Mm -hmm. Jesus repeatedly said over and over, I'm going to die on the cross to pay for your sins. He said it over and over and then he said, I'm going to come back to life in three days to prove that I am who I am and I can do what I said I'd do. Now, if you hadn't done the second part, the first part doesn't really matter. He had to be resurrected. He had to come back from the dead to prove that he could forgive sins. The two go together. Now let me give you some good news. The Bible says in this, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So we have forgiveness of sins because of God's rich grace. Now we're all imperfect and we all carry regrets, don't we? We all carry remorse and we always wish we'd done things differently. We all have sins and things that we feel bad about or guilty about. But God doesn't want you carrying guilt through your life. God doesn't want you to carry a load of shame through your life. The whole reason that he died on the cross was so that you could be free from all of that guilt and all of that shame. Guilt wastes an awful lot of energy. It fatigues you, it tires you, and it robs you of your peace of mind. But Jesus said, I came to die for your sins, so you don't have to die for them. Hallelujah. I was hung on the cross once, so you would stop nailing yourself to a cross every day of your life. I don't know if you've ever asked the question or thought about it. Who really killed Jesus? Who put Jesus on the cross? Who is to blame for Jesus being on the cross? It wasn't Judas, was it? It wasn't Caiaphas, the high priest. It wasn't Pilate, the governor. It wasn't the Romans. It wasn't the religious leaders. And it wasn't even the crowd. The answer is twofold. Who put Jesus on the cross? And this may shock you. The answer is twofold. The first is this. God did. God put Jesus on the cross. This was his plan from the very beginning. This was plan A. There is no plan B. There is no plan B. This was always plan B. Plan A, rather, from the foundation of the world. This was plan A. It's why Jesus came to earth to die for our sins. That's the whole reason. It was God's plan before any of us were ever born. Here's what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
In other words, we've all done our own thing. We've all left God's plan to follow our own. And it says there, and the Lord laid on him. We're talking about Jesus. The guilt and the sins of all of us. From prison and trial, they led him away to his death. But who among the people realised that he was dying for their sins? That he was suffering for their punishment? Nobody realised that at the time. On with Isaiah 53. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. That was God's plan right from the very beginning. I don't know if you noticed in this passage the change in tense. The first part is the past sense. He had done no wrong. And then it changes to future. Because this was written 700 years before Jesus was born. 700 years before Jesus was born. This account in Isaiah 53 was written. It's a prophecy. And Isaiah is predicting exactly what's going to happen to the Messiah. The Son of God who comes to earth. Exactly how it was written. It was part of God's plan, plan A, no plan B. This was it. This was the make or break plan, right from before the world was created. But the second one might surprise you as well. Who put Jesus on the cross? We did. You and I. If none of us had ever sinned, Jesus wouldn't have to die for our sins, would he? The Bible says this in Romans chapter 4 verse 25. He was handed over to die because of our sins. He was raised to life to make us right with God. Note the inclusion of the word us in this passage. He was raised from the dead. This is what Easter is all about. He was raised from the dead to make us right with God. And who's included in the word us? All of us. All of us. You, me, us. We're made right with God. So we've been completely forgiven and that gives me hope. I'm not facing any judgment. I have hope because I have been completely forgiven. Number two. And this is, a, this is interesting. The second reason Jesus' resurrection gives us hope is that we're no longer afraid to die <clears throat> we are no longer afraid to die when Jesus was nailed to the cross one of the things he did was break the power of death and he also broke the power of the fear of death the fear of death is universal everyone has it because it's unknown we don't know what happens when we die. But what did Jesus do? He came back. He came back to life. You know, if Jesus hadn't been resurrected from the dead, you wouldn't even know that there's life after death. You wouldn't know it. You might guess at it. You might say, well, I hope there's life after death. But you'd have nothing to prove it. But Jesus Christ came back and said, I've conquered death. There is a greater life after death. That's our hope, isn't it? That's the Christian's hope. But Jesus Christ came back and said, I've conquered death. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 11, verse 25. It's Jesus talking to Mary, I think. Uh, or was it Martha, at, uh, at the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. 
and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he put the question to her. He said, do you believe this? Do you believe this? What did she say? Yes, Lord, I believe. And he called Lazarus forth. So there's a reason for hope. If Jesus Christ hasn't resurrected on Easter Sunday, we're all hopeless, helpless, and death is the end. It's all over. That's it. Now, when Jesus died, they buried him in a tomb. In those days, they didn't bury people under the ground the way we do. They placed them on shelves in caves. I've been into a couple of them. You have to bend down low and go in. It's like this hollow has been carved out of the... The rock, sandstone, limestone, whatever, it's not a hard rock. And then it's like the central space where you go in. Then on each side, there's a shelf about the size of a body. And sometimes, if it's a big family, they might go through to another room and you'll find shelves there with lots of boxes, stone boxes, and those are called ossuaries, right? So what happened? They laid the person in the tomb, they sealed the tomb for three years, and they came back, put the bones in an ossuary, and put them on a shelf. That's why there was always room in a grave, right? Because the people were taken off those shelves, and their bones were just stored in boxes. Ossuaries, you can see them all around. While I was there, they found Caiaphas's ossuary. They found his whole family. And they've got the one that has his, had his bones in it. It's interesting, isn't it? It's, written, it's scratched onto the limestone box. Caiaphas. <coughs> so they'd put a stone in front of this cave and they would roll it away and put somebody in and then roll it back. And they did this because entire families for generations would have a family tomb and there'd be a lot of people buried in the same cave. As you walk down the Mount of Olives you can see all these caves and you can see in and you just see these jumbled up piles of osseries, hundreds of them in these caves it's through the centuries. Um, Orthodox Jewish people have been buried in these caves. So after Jesus died, <coughs> excuse me, Joseph of Arimathea volunteered his tomb and they rolled a huge stone in front of it. But then Pilate had it sealed so that it couldn't be moved back and he posted Roman guards on either side. Now the twelve disciples who were followers of Jesus at this time, they're scared to death. They run. They turn tail and they run because they're scared. None of them believed the resurrection would happen. They're hiding in fear. They're disillusioned. They're depressed. They, they, they believe they're going to be caught and executed next as the followers of Jesus. And so they're running away and they're hiding. And then three days later, what happens? Easter Sunday morning, one of the women who's travelling with the disciples, Mary Magdalene, decides she's going to go to the tomb to finish the job of wrapping Jesus' body. Right? It was a real rush job because Sabbath was coming and they had to get him properly into a grave before sundown right? because that was Shabbat. So she goes to the tomb and when she gets there she finds the seal had been broken and the stone rolled away. There's no body there and the grave clothes that Jesus had been wrapped in are folded and sitting there on a step in the tomb. By the way, some people say, well maybe they stole the body. Well here's a tip. If you ever steal a body, leave the clothes on please. <laughs> uh, 
there would be no reason to take the clothes off a person and steal the body. If you're going to steal the body, you might as well steal it with the clothes on, but they left there. So Mary thinks the body's been stolen, that's her version of the logical conclusion, and then she hears a voice, doesn't she, as we heard this morning. So she turns around and Jesus is standing there, the risen Jesus Christ, and he says to her, Mary, and when she calls out his name, as she'd heard her name called many times, she knew it was the Lord. And he says, Jesus says, go tell all my brothers, go tell all the disciples that I'm alive and I'm coming to see them. So Mary ran to the house where the disciples were inside with the door locked. And she banged on the door and they let her in and she says, you guys aren't going to believe this. Jesus is alive. And you know what these great men of faith did? They doubted her. They didn't believe her. This is one of the great reasons why the Gospels are so accurate and authentic. Because in those days, the testimony of a woman meant nothing. And yet the entire, the entire truth of God's resurrection, of Jesus' resurrection, was on the basis of the testimony of one woman. It's just amazing, isn't it? If we were going to make up a story like that, it would never have been a woman. It would have been Peter or John, right? One of the leaders. But no, it was a woman. It was Mary, Mary Magdalene. Mary, you've seen a ghost. <coughs> You're hallucinating. <coughs> You're just in deep grief and they don't believe her at all. The point is this, even the disciples, none of Jesus' followers actually believed he'd come back to life until they became eyewitnesses. It wasn't just hearsay, they said, I've got to see him. Now let me ask you a question. If you saw someone walking down the street who you had just buried three days earlier, how would you feel about that? <laughs> A little bit confused, maybe scared to death, frightened, fearful and excited. A shade of white. Do you think that you would ever forget that? I have. Yeah? My Uncle Bill, I saw him after he passed away. Yeah. Would you ever forget it? Not likely. No, no not forget it. Would it change your world view about life and death? Yeah, it does. It does. Thank you, Michelle. Would it give you a new hope? Absolutely. For sure that there might be life after death, or rather that there is life after death. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that's difficult to explain without the resurrection is the sudden change in the disciples. Because at the crucifixion, they're all scared to death. They're running, they're defeated, they're demoralised, more D words. They're in despair, they're disillusioned, they're depressed. Three days later, they're ready to take on Nero and the Roman Empire. What happened? Hope. They'd seen Jesus. They were eyewitnesses. They knew physically something had happened. Not just them, but a lot of other people did too. But now they've got courage, confidence. Here's what Peter wrote down in his letter. Uh, 2 Peter 1.16 For we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we saw his majestic splendour with our own eyes. And not only these original 12, but Jesus came and stayed on earth for another 40 days, walking around Jerusalem for 40 days. That's literally tens of thousands of people became believers in a very short time because there were so many eyewitnesses. Here's what the Bible says, Acts chapter 1, verse 3. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. They saw him and he talked with them about the kingdom of God. Can you imagine being one of the executioners who put Jesus on the cross? one of those soldiers, and then you saw him die, 
you took him down from the cross and gave him to Mary and the other women. You know he's dead. And then you see him walking around Jerusalem talking to people three days later. <laughs> How does that work for you? Um, hey? <laughs> he's back. That would be strange. Paul lists just a few of the eyewitnesses and this isn't even a complete list. In 1 Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15 he says I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Jesus Christ died for our sins just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For 40 days he has multiple meetings with a lot of people, friends, that's what's called conclusive proof. This was why the church exploded within years. There's some commentators who believe that there were 30,000 members of the church in Jerusalem around about this time. And then it had grown to nearly half a million by the time it exploded all over the Roman Empire. What had been persecuted within 300 years, is now the official religion of the Roman Empire. Why? Because of the resurrection. <coughs> because there were so many eyewitnesses. Let's wind this up. Are you in a hopeless situation? There's nothing that our God cannot do. You, ha you can have hope because anything is possible. So, let's choose to embrace the hope that is offered to you in Jesus. Let hope lift your spirits. Easter is the power of God's love revealed. Easter is the reminder that because Jesus is alive, we have hope. Amen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ instills hope in the face of life's trials. And Easter is a reminder that you live day in and day out with power that can overcome any challenge. In our darkest days, it gives us light. In overwhelming discouragement, it gives us faith. In the midst of devastating loss, it gives us joy. And in times of devices, divisiveness, it gives us something that unifies us. The tomb is empty, friends. Jesus is alive, and that gives us hope. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.